Hello. <laughs> Today we are going to try and demystify fly fishing. Uh, my name is James Gerritsen. I am the owner and operator of About Trout. We are based in northwest New Mexico and primarily guide on the San Juan River, but we also guide southern Colorado as well. And the aim of this outfitter is to just provide provide education-based guiding to anglers of all skill sets. I have worked in the fly fishing business for the last 20 years and it all started when I was 14 years old and had a worker's permit and my mom would drive me to Orvis in Tyson's Corner, Virginia, store number 55. Uh, so thank you so much for that mom. Working inside of fly fishing for so long you just tend to hear the same things over and over. It's the wrong fly, the moon was 28.9 degrees to the east instead of to the west, wrong color, X, Y, Z, etc, etc, etc. We guide 12 months a year here um, on the San Juan and as a fishing guide on top of learning and having fun, which are the two most important things, and we all believe that, there is an expectation to at least put one trout in the net, and we always try to limit out on smiles. But no, enough with that. Working in rain, snow, high water, low water, muddy water, clear water, blowout events, wind storms, dust storms, you know, I've had the privilege of being a fishing guide, and I have the best job in the world. What I want to share with you is the mental checklist that I go through in the ever-changing conditions out on the water that will try to give my clients the best shot at hooking into a fish. I'm not here to say that my way is the best way or the only way, and in fact I'm a big believer in big shades of gray, big brush strokes, there's, there's many different roads to salvation, right? But this is the mental checklist that I go through and it has saved me time and time again on the water, especially when the fishing is tough. You know, we always joke anyone can be a guide when the fishing is good. It's when the fishing is absolutely garbage um, and the conditions are terrible. That's kind of what separates the men from the boys. If you were to boil fly fishing down into its simplest, purest form, that would be where are the trout and how do you get a fly to them. Many of us have been taught to think fly first and today we're going to talk about thinking trout first. So what does trout first mean? When you think about trout, about trout.com, think about the animal first, what they like, what makes them tick, their, their biology, and how they react to outside factors and weather factors. And then once you figure that out, we're gonna figure, you can try to figure out where those trout are holding, living, and feeding bank to bank. We're gonna skip lakes on this one. We're gonna just try to keep it simple, as simple as possible. And then when you see that water, how do you rig to that water type and get your flies to the trout? So let's learn about trout. The variables you will encounter on a day of fishing, how the trout react to those variables, and finally, letting the river tell you how to fish. So many of us try to match our water to the rigs that we've already rigged up because we have confidence in them, but I wanna to try to get anglers thinking about matching and tailoring their rigs to the water that's right in front of them. In fly fishing, it's important to note that the only sure thing is that there is no black and white. What I've noticed over the years are just particular patterns and trends, and that's what makes this so fun. I have seen the complete opposite happen in every single one of these scenarios, but there are definitely predictable trends and pattern sets that if you can learn how to recognize, you'll certainly up your success on the water, or at least try to have a better understanding of what's going on out there. The other thing is, if you get nothing else out of this video, it's just important to have fun. That's why we do this, and if you're not having fun on the water, then maybe you should spend some more time on the golf course. Trout, let's talk about them. The first thing is trout are cold-blooded. Um, so when the water is colder, uh, the trout are more sluggish, and when the water is warmer, the trout are more active. Um, that also is impacts, water temperature also impacts trout's metabolic rate, being cold-blooded creatures. Uh, when it's colder and they're more sluggish, um, their metabolic rate is lower, and as the water warms up, their metabolic needs increase. Um, to a certain point, around 67 degrees is above that is really gonna start to stress the trout out, and I don't recommend fishing above 67 degrees. I'd never wanna hurt my business partners, and you risk a chance of killing fish even with great catch and release practices. Another thing to consider about our river and creek friends is that water is three-dimensional, and trout do live in a three-dimensional space. 
Um, you know, when you're looking down on the river, sometimes it's easy to think in terms of one plane, but those trout can be high, they can be in the middle, and they can be low. And again, that's all going to be relative depending on water depth and the arena that you're fishing in. Generally, with trout, there's two types of trout water. There's transitional water and there's holding water or vice versa. Um, holding water is water where the trout can live and eat, um, where they hang out a lot. You can pretty much always find them there. And again, I'm painting in really, really broad brush strokes, just trying to keep this super basic. Transitional water is water that those fish will move in and out of, either to spawn or to feed. A really good example of that is like a riffle. You know, another thing when thinking about trout and kind of learning about our adversary, if you will, or our best friends, our BFFs, is that trout will move to food. Not only will they move through a water column, but they'll also move from place to place. Um, a couple years ago, we caught the same like 29 inch rainbow, one time on a streamer and one time on a dry fly. And they were probably, those fish, were, the, that fish was caught a quarter mile of where I first hooked it. And then the guy I had in my boat caught it on a dry fly way down the river. So trout do move if they have that opportunity. Now again, this is all relative. Another thing when considering trout is just that they, there's, they spawn, right? There's a pre-spawn and a post-spawn. So, you know, before spawn, those fish are trying to pack in calories, you know, um, because the spawn is stressful and also afterwards, you know, that's why, you know, streamer fishing in the fall is popular because those brown trout are packing on protein, getting ready for that spawning process. Also with the spawn, you just, you know, different trout spawn at different times, different species. Rainbows are traditionally spring spawners, brown trout, fall spawners, brook trout, technically a char, uh, they are fall spawners as well. And water temperature will affect when they spawn, something to consider. When thinking about trout, also just consider the venue. Is this a high density fishery where like the San Juan where there's literally trout everywhere? Or is this a low density fishery where there's less fish per mile? Um, and it's something to think about on the way that you'll eventually approach the river, being more choosy with your spots. Then, you know, again, in this thing, when we're thinking about trout and trout first, are these stock fish? Are these wild fish? Uh, they're two different animals, really. Those stock fish, a lot of times are raised in pens. They grow up on an artificial diet. They really have a propensity to pod up. Um, all the time because they find comfort in numbers like when they were in that hatchery environment um, versus wild fish and stocked fish are notorious for you know eating a lot of trashy flies um, and just overall being dumber now the longer that they're in the system they can naturalize and become more picky the other thing to talk about are there's basically two types of eats from trout and I'm not talking like streamer versus dry fly but there are induced takes and there's when trout are feeding um, with trout, they don't have hands, at least not that I'm aware of, and so an induced take is throwing something like a mop fly or a giant egg when there's really not a lot of eggs in the system, or just some loud, gaudy, obnoxious fly that looks like nothing, and the trout put their mouth on it, kind of force feeding them, if you will. That's an induced take. Um, when trout are feeding, and there's prolific bug activity or it's a nutrient rich or a bug rich river those fish can really become conditioned and keyed in on certain insects and certain profiles so you can learn about that induced take and game it against them maybe there's a bunch of picky fish and you roll you know a big attractor pattern through there and force them to eat it um, or you know you these fish are not going to touch those trashier junkier rigs like squirmies and mops and eggs uh, because they're so fixated on that insect that's hatching at that time now that we've learned a little bit more about our cold-blooded friends, we can talk about what affects them, where the trout are, and what the trout do. Water, weather, and angling pressure affect trout behavior and will affect the way that you're going to fish for them. So water is just a catch-all for wet things. Uh, we're just gonna keep it simple and, and only talk about uh, moving water. Most, uh, most fly anglers are fishing in, in moving water for trout. Water also refers to the trout, the particular trout that live there, the temperature, the forage base, clarity, you know, etc. So let's talk quickly about the three most common venues that trout anglers fish in. You have your freestones, your tailwaters, and your spring creeks. Freestones are going to be the least stable of the three, and what I mean by that is that temperatures on those on those rivers and creeks can fluctuate wildly. 
The flows can fluctuate wildly. They're groundwater dependent. We need that snowpack to recharge the water table. There can be spring influence as well. A lot of them will freeze over in the winter unless there is that spring influence in certain sections. So just something to keep in mind if you're fishing a freestone um, is things can change quick and they can change throughout the day. Uh, moving on, we have tailwaters. So a tailwater is when they dam up a river or a creek um, and then when they let water out of the dam, it kind of looks like a, a little tail, right? Um, and they're very stable usually, uh, constant flow in most cases. There's again exceptions to all these rules. Tail waters are very stable, stable water temperature is usually stable flows, creates a ton of bug life with that consistency and they're usually just fish factories. Moving on, you have spring creeks, which are the most stable. I mean, it boils out of the ground usually and um, it's a consistent flow and a consistent temperature. The only thing that'll really mess with that is if it's an area with some snow melt that can get into that spring creek and stain the water a little bit, blow it out, or if there's a problem tributary that flows in, like a little freestone creek that can get muddy and, and wash it out. And then when thinking about spring creeks, just thinking about freestones and even tailwaters where there are where there is spring influence. Um, you know, on the Animus, just north of here, where we guide on some private property, there's a lot of springs in there that keep that little section of the river uh, warmer. Something to consider, the effect of springs on the system that you are fishing. Those little springs can create a little oasis, especially in the winter and in the summer. If the water's really hot, those springs can cool it down and create a refuge for trout. So let's briefly chat about tr how trout react to water. You know, let's talk about flow. You know, in my experience during high flow, you know, it's going to push some of those fish to the banks and into structure that's creating, you know, pockets from that. We current is not congruent from surface to bottom. As you get deeper, it doesn't maintain that same ripping current speed and as you get down the water column it slows down so that's something to consider during high high flow those trout are usually low and deep um, they don't want to fight the current or they're in slower pockets eddies behind rocks and they're always in those spots as well but just something to think about if you're ever on the river during a high water event low water is going to do the opposite those trout those skinny riffles maybe on the side where they'd move in to feed they can't fit in there without getting sniped out by ospreys. So it's going to concentrate the trout into some of that deeper water. Again, just start thinking about the water in the, as a three-dimensional space and where those trout can be, high, middle, low, you know? Thinking about that they, they're just not here on the bottom. They could be here in the middle or here up top eating dry flies. Do you like that? Do you like that little puppet show there? Um, and then, you know, one thing I have noticed is with some of that quicker water, the trout do tend to be a little less selective. They don't have as much time to look at your presentation and notice things like sloppy drifts um, or the, or the uh, you know, the, the individual characteristics of the patterns. Um, so there is, I have noticed that also in stained water, you know, the trout do seem to be a little less uh, selective. You know, and then when talking about water, we want to talk about water temperature. When the water is cold, the trout get more sluggish, and when the water is warmer, they get more active. And once you start to see that water kind of getting above the 40 degree-ish range, um, you'll start to see those fish move into some of the shallower stuff adjacent to deep water. Um, and then when it's warmer, you know, you'll see those fish gorging in the riffles to try to fill that, or to fulfill that metabolic need. But just thinking about these these animals and how they react to these outside things can really help you locate where they are in between the two banks and up and through the water column. Um, the other thing when we're talking about water is just what is in the water, which sounds silly, but you know, if on the San Juan, the biomass of insects there is going to be, you know, midges, mayflies. Um, we have they're not insects, but there's lots and lots of aquatic worms, annelids. We have black flies, we have scuds. So thinking about the forage base in that river um, can really help you um, understand their relationship with that forage base and things they might like to eat. They also stock a lot of small trout in the San Juan for them to grow big and naturalize and the trout eat each other. So something else to consider. We don't really have a forage fish outside of other trout. So just thinking about things like that. All right, so we talked about water, things like water temperature, the venue that you might be fishing in, where the trout could be in that three-dimensional space clarity, how it affects trout, you know, where it moves them to when that current's ripping, what happens when the water is low and it condenses them in certain areas. 
dovetailing off that, we're gonna go right into weather. Um, and when I think about weather, I'm thinking about things like warming trends, cooling trends, a clear day versus an overcast day, storm fronts, season, you know, time of day um, is a big one. And, you know, warming and cooling trends are important, you know, in the summer, in the fall, in the winter especially. So right now in the winter, we're especially concerned with warming trends. Um, two weeks ago, I was guiding in 12 degrees, and the last two days I was guiding in 40 degrees. And the difference between those days were kind of what I fished and what I saw out there. On, this, on the days where there was that warming trend, the fish were definitely more active. Even though the San Juan is a tailwater, the further you get away from the dam, ambient air temperature can cool that water down or warm that water up. So closer to the dam in the winter always fishes, fishes well and it's very consistent, but as you start to move down river, ambient air temperature can really affect water temperature and in turn fish behavior. You know, on the flip side of the coin, a cooling trend can really slow those fish down or if it's the heat of the summer and those fish have been really stressed out, that cooling trend can cool the water down and you can experience some great fishing without stressing the trout out. You know, then talking about clear days versus overcast days, you know, I am of the belief that um, you know, trout really fear death from above, and especially on the Juan, we have lots of birds of prey, lots of ospreys, so it's not uncommon to see them dive in and snipe a trout out. And it just seems like those trout are a little bit more secure um, and, and more willing to come up and, and rise and eat the midges coming off when there is some sort of overcast. Um, on clearer days, they definitely seem a little bit more skittish, especially in the shallow water. These aren't hard and fast rules. These are kind of just general things I've noticed. Um, on those overcast days, whether I'm creek fishing or on a river, it does seem like the fish are a little bit more secure, less chance to get scared by things like glare, things like that. Um, you know, this isn't hardback science, this is just anecdotal. You know, speaking of weather, we want to talk about, you know, storm fronts. You know, I've watched it happen. I'm not a big barometric pressure guy when talking about, you know, rivers and creeks, but I definitely have noticed that the fishing can slow on a leading edge of a storm front, and I've seen it just guiding out there where you have this rainstorm building and building in the summer and the fishing kind of slows down. Then the storm breaks, it starts raining, and those fish are really eating um, well, and the, and the day is back to normal. But sometimes it seems like that leading edge um, of a storm front can shut things down. Again, this is just kind of things um, that I've noticed. You know, when talking about weather, it's also important to just consider the season. You know, are you fishing in the spring? Are you fishing in the fall? Are trout spawning then? Are they moving then? You know, what what's going on? Just keeping those things um, in the back of your mind. You know, usually in colder water in the winter, those trout are gonna be in slower water, right? Not expending energy, not fighting the current, you know, thinking about, you know, even a variance in a couple degrees, maybe fishing later in the day in the winter when the water is warmed up a little bit or in the summer fishing early, early in the morning so it doesn't get too hot and the fish aren't stressed. So thinking about the season or, you know, the season in terms of, hey, you know, I know trout are spawning this time, there's more eggs in the system, or I'm not going to stomp on brown trout reds and kill my friends, or it's the spring and I'm not going to stomp on rainbow trout reds and kill my friends, unless you want to. Maybe you're into that, live your truth. Uh, but moving on, also time of day is a big one. Some rivers you can really time um, the hatches, and right after this we're going to go into water and weather and their relationship to trout food. But you know, there was a time on the San Juan where I could time a midge hatch every day at 11.30 and I would just race down there and I'd have this little private hatch from about 11.30, about 1.45, 2 o'clock. And by the time the other boats caught me, I'd row away and it was like it never happened. So when you're out in the water and, and if you have the ability to, to, to notice things and think about when you saw these, you know, some of these hatches can be more predictable um, as it warms up, as it cools down in the evening. But just thinking about these things when you're out on the water can really help you narrow down um, where fish are. Any water slash weather trend that positively impacts bugs will positively impact the trout fishing. It's important to note that just like trout, those bugs don't just look at their watch and go, hey, it's May 5th, it's time for me to come hatch. Um, their their, their uh, hatch cycles are going to be dependent is on water temperature as well as water flow. Consider alternative food sources behind the fly fishing classics like stoneflies, caddis, mayflies, midges, 
you know, annelids. Um, think about things like scuds, eggs. You know, some some trout rivers have suckers and whitefish. They spawn at different times, imitating those eggs. Thinking about things like sculpins, whatever forage bases you have in those rivers for those trout to eat besides kind of the most widely accepted fly patterns. And then weather also affects water, right? We talked about warming trends and cooling trends, warming up the water, cooling down the water. Um, you know, trout's metabolism tends to peak around 63 degrees, so that's something to note. Um, thinking about these things, again, thinking trout first. And I mentioned how that weather and how that water can impact bug life. It can delay hatches, hatches can happen early. You know, there, there is no hard set thing. Um, so painting in broad brush strokes uh, when thinking about these things and considering it. And then, you know, water and weather also impact the spawn. I've seen fish on the San Juan cutting reds in August. They don't all just decide to go spawn in October or November. You know, if they all did that, there wouldn't be a high rate of survival. So those spawn times can be staggered as well as rainbow trout. I've seen them spawning as early as February. So again, just thinking about these things. The last note on weather is I get asked this a lot as a guide about precipitation. Uh, you know, the classic guide joke is, the fish are already wet, um, and that one, it always lands. Classic dad joke. But I have never really noticed, you know, rain uh, to affect things, impact things much while I'm out there, unless it's, like, heavy enough to start blowing stuff out. And then, yeah, when the mud comes in there, that's a whole different conversation. But kind of a light, medium rain, um, it can be uncomfortable if you don't have the right gear, but it hasn't, in my experience, ever shut the fishing down. And again, you know, as a guide and a father, I, I do tend to repeat myself, set, 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 set. But, you know, I just want to really try to get you to think trout first. Not so much the fly, but considering things like water, weather, and angling pressure, how that's impacting these fish, and adjusting accordingly throughout the day. All right, now let's talk about the last thing, which is pressure, which is, I'm sure, our shared collective favorite thing um, to see out on the river, right? That's why we go out there, to, to hang out with tons and tons of people and not escape uh, from the day-to-day -day realities of life. Uh, but no, pressure is the opposite of good. It's never a good thing. Um, and depending on how big the river or creek is, it can really impact your day, but it's gonna force fish out of lies, you know, heavily pressured, waters it really educates the trout makes them more picky but yeah i mean i've never heard anyone say you know pull up and be like oh i'm so glad the entire parking lot's full and i have to bring my own rock to stand on this is fly fishing this is what it's all about on that note i just want to say that i do guide the san juan which has a horrible reputation of being a crowded fishery and there is a great book it's called the wisdom of the guides and kind of one of the og guides out here the godfathers of the san juan johnny gomez wrote in a book in 1998 that the san juan is as crowded as you want to make it it's 2024 and that still holds true just like fish people react to weather people react to things being too hot and too cold and we have jobs and we have lives and we have families you know one thing i tell my clients i'm going to put it on the internet but take this if you will Peak time on the San Juan River, whether it's January or whether it is peak season, is always going to be 8.30 to about 3 p.m. And this is coming from someone that's out there 250 days a year. Between that time is the heaviest user base. So if you fish earlier or fish later, given the season, right, you can't fish at 6 in the winter. It's blackout, you know. But in the summer, you can fish longer before the state park closes at sunset, you know. So working around anglers and using that to your advantage can really give you these opportunities to find solitude on even the most crowded waters. So something to consider too. Um, changing your behaviors as an angler to experience um, you know, less crowds. Like fishing in less popular times doesn't necessarily mean the fishing is bad. It just means it's not as comfortable. Thinking about this can really maximize your experience. So just considering those things too in terms in terms of pressure. And you know on some rivers like the Juan, you know, you can watch someone fish a run for an hour and just because someone someone's fished something doesn't mean that they've fished it properly and those fish are used to people so you can go back in there and it's like they were never there so again there is no black and white on a small creek I definitely don't want to be you know have two anglers up above me pounding fish that's gonna put them down on a tailwater with a ton of fish and a high fish density 
you know, that's really not going to be as big of an issue. You know, if you're floating a free stone with a lower fish density in your boat number nine in the string of boats, that's certainly going to impact things. Maybe put your boat on a little earlier or come back behind everybody later. So just thinking like this can really, really improve your time out there. So I'm a big believer in adapting my setup to the prevailing conditions and trends. So when I get to the water, I'm going to think about things like hatches, water depth, is it high water? Is it low water? Is it clear water? Is it off color? Is it really fast? And is this a high pressure system? You know, and also is it a high density system? Are there lots of trout or are there very few trout? Just kind of learning the venue before I show up there. Thinking about those present conditions, you know, because if I show up to the river and there's 50 fish rising, I'm going to fish a dry fly, right? Never leave feeding fish to go find fish. And then when you think about your rig considerations, you know, married to that, uh, where do you want your flies to present in the column? I just mentioned, you know, you see rising fish, well, those fish are high column, you know? If you don't see any activity, you can rule out the top and you know the fish are either in the middle or they're on the bottom. So rig accordingly. Um, your weight, right? If it's slower water, you're not going to need as much weight to punch through those faster surface currents to get your flies down to depth. Um, and also, speaking of water depth, that can help you in the relationship between, you know, your flies and your indicator, your indicator and your weight, or if you're euro nymphing, the distance between your tippet ring and either your point or your tag fly. Thinking about length of tippet, you know, how you want those flies to present, you know, are you fishing deep and heavy and you want your flies shorter together to kind of detect more strikes or are you fishing long and light and clear conditions where you might not get the best strike detection but spacing your flies further apart you're going to get a way more natural drift. And then the other thing is, you know, um, are these fish pressured? You know, I've noticed, uh, you know, with, with trout, you know, the more, the more pressured they are, I try to err on the side of small if they're being really finicky. If I'm in a new spot, I don't rig up until I look at the water that I'm about to go fish. And I think that's really important. You know, all the time when I'm on the wand, I'll chat somebody up in the parking lot that's never been there and they're already rigging. Well, the water depth throughout that system changes. Uh, the current speed throughout that system changes. Spot to spot, even as close as 50 feet apart, you'll have to make those micro adjustments. I'm always running this playbook through my mind um, when I'm out on the water. So just start to think trout first. You know, again, back to the riser analogy, are you gonna crush them on the head with a streamer if you see that? Maybe, meat for life, baby. But thinking about trout and how they're reacting to the variables and how they react to those water and weather conditions and the presence of other anglers will really help you tailor your rig. The river will tell you how to fish. If you're fishing a river that's only two feet deep, you probably don't want to fish really heavy and really long. Deep is relative, just as shallow is relative. And thinking in kind of this gray scale and then making those adjustments are going to help you. You know, you're fishing in the winter, it's 37 degrees, no bug activity. Maybe seek out, you know, thinking trout first, we know that they're cold blooded, looking for those slower, deeper, those holding water spots in the winter, that winter water, if you will. On the flip side of the coin, it's summer, it's 60 degree water temperatures, there's bug activity, you know, and you see some people out there that are only fishing those deeper holes targeting the shallow riffles and that transitional water where you know the trout will be on the feed can really save your day and give you a little bit of breathing room on some popular rivers. On the net of flies, flies don't matter until they, they do. I know that's controversial, but flies don't matter. Attributes of flies matter. Things like size, profile, color. At different times of the day or on different fisheries, and even day to day, one of those three things can make a big difference. For me, size is usually my number one, followed by profile and color can be a tertiary concern. But there's times when all three are equally important. Again, there's no always, there's no never. And there have been days where you make that color switch and it's lights out. So again, just thinking of these things, this isn't the only way. 
there is no hard and set fast rules. That's what makes fly fishing so fun is just the chess game day in and day out. I really do think if you're nymph fishing though, that 70% of the equation there is where you're presenting your flies in the water column and making sure you're getting clean drifts. It's better to fish the wrong fly in the right way. There is no silver bullet. You don't just throw a fly out there and have a fish jump on it. You have to fish it and you have to fish it where those trout are. Um, I wish there was a silver bullet. If there is one, you can DM me or send me an email. I would love to test those for you. But in my experience, it just doesn't exist. Um, if you are finding out where those trout are, thinking trout first, then you put a fly in front of their face. You know, th th these fish aren't Socrates or Einstein. They have pea-sized brains. And by learning a little bit about their biology and what makes them tick, you can game their biology against them. So let's go through the process flow chart, if you will. So you show up to the river, and you start running your variables to these heads. Is it an empty parking lot? Is it a packed parking lot? Is there somebody above me? And then you get to the water, right? We haven't rigged yet, but are there rising fish? Is it deep water? Is it clear water, right? Thinking about these things and rig, then fish. If you start catching fish, you're doing the right thing. Um, if you're not, then kind of go back through the process flow chart. Hey, the flies I'm fishing are really bright and flashy and it's really clear. Or hey, I noticed that these fish are suspended and my nymphs are getting under them. Or hey, you know, I saw some rising fish and I threw my dry fly and I'm getting rejected. Is it because your casts are sloppy and it's dragging and you're scaring the fish? Or maybe dropping down the size of your bug for those pickier fish? Um, thinking about these things. Then, you know, throughout the day, especially as a guide, I'm always trying to identify a trend. Um, and, and if I can't identify one, I'll just constantly recalibrate. And, and that's kind of it. That's, that's the majority of fly fishing is thinking about how trout react to those outside variables. Where are they in the river? Are they in slow water? Are they in transitional water, holding water? And then rigging to them um, and getting flies in front of their face. So, you know, it can seem like fly fishing is, you know, really intimidating, but it's not if you think trout first. And just remember to have fun out there. Well, I think uh, that should wrap it up. We've learned a little bit about our cold-blooded friends and how to adapt our rigs to the water presented in front of us, as long as adapt and recalibrate to the current uh, conditions and trends. So I really hope you guys enjoyed this video. I actually give a presentation called A Guide's Approach to the Water. Um, I've presented from, you know, from Southern California to Northern California all the way out to Long Island in New York. Um, but this is just a really watered down version of the presentation. I really wanted to only focus on learning more about trout and then just a thought exercise in rigging for your day out there on the water. If you like this presentation and you want to see more stuff like this, let me know in the comments below. We can get really technical talking about leader formulas, drag, fly selection, um, and really, really start to split hairs um, in terms of presentation and approach, as well as Euro, streamer fishing, dry fly fishing, all the stuff that we guide here consistently in About Trout. So thank you so much everybody for watching this video. Remember that this is not gospel. These are just generalities broad brush strokes, but what I want is just to have you guys thinking about this throughout your fly fishing day on the water. Just remember to always have fun out there, and um, you know, fly fishing is way too important to take seriously. So I hope you remember that. Uh, I'll see you guys in the next video. One love.